you'll be able to hear the robot lady. And as everyone is filtering in, we will get all of the housekeeping boring stuff out of the way. Uh, first of all, thank you so much to everyone for coming both to Chaya and Sequoia tonight and all of our attendees. It means a lot that in this very strange times where everything is done virtually that you will choose to do a social activity at night on your computer <laughs> after you probably <laughs> spent all day on your computer. So we greatly appreciate it. Um, if you are new to our events, welcome. If you're not, also welcome. Uh, we are Belmont Books. We are an independent bookstore in the greater Boston area. Um, as a reminder, we are open for browsing. So if you're local and you miss being in a bookstore, we are open. If you miss books but aren't comfortable being in a bookstore, that is okay. We have curbside pickup. So you place your order online and we lovingly select your book from the bookshelf, bring it out and put it out for you so you can come and pick it up at your leisure. We also ship around the US. So if you're not local and you still wanna support an independent bookstore, we can do that for you. Or if you wanna support your own local indie, that's equally as amazing. All of our events right now are virtual. Um, so we have one more event later this week with Dhruti Umragar, who's gonna be in conversation with Ellen Berry of the New York Times. It's co-hosted with another great indie in Florida called Books and Books. I believe 3D's book Honor was just selected for a Reese Witherspoon book club pick. Um, so that's really exciting. And we'll hope you'll attend that one. That one is Thursday, I believe at seven. And I think that's all the events this week. If you haven't attended a virtual event with us before, pretty simple. I will introduce the authors tonight and then they will talk for roughly 40 to 50 minutes. And then we will open it up to questions. I will be here monitoring the chat. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat box. It's totally fine. We also have a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. It looks like two little speech bubbles that says Q&A. You can submit your questions there, but either one works. Um, I'll probably catch all of them, so you don't have to worry. All right, we are going to get started. We're gonna start with our in-conversation partner tonight, who is a very dear friend of the bookstore and a familiar mm -hmm. face if you've attended any in-person events before or virtual events. We thank Chaya so much for doing these and connecting us with all of these amazing authors. Um, Chaya Bhuvaneshwar is a physician and writer whose debut story collection, White Dancing Elements, was a Kirkus Best Book and finalist for a Penn Bingham Award. It's pretty exciting. I think we also did an event for White Dancing Elements, didn't we, Chaya? I feel like we did. Yes. Um, and then we're here tonight to celebrate Sequoia's book, How High We Go in the Dark. Sequoia Nagamatsu is a Japanese American writer and managing editor of Psychopomp Magazine, an online quarterly dedicated to innovative prose. Originally from Hawaii and the San Francisco Bay Area, he holds an MFA in creative writing from Southern Illinois University and a BA in anthropology from Grinnell College. His work has appeared in many publications, including the Fairy Tale Review and Tin House. He's also the author of an award-winning short story collection, Where We Go When All We Were Is Gone, and teaches creative writing at St. Olaf College. He currently lives in Minnesota with his wife, cat, and a robot dog named Calvino. I'm very interested to hear more about this robot dog if there is time. <laughs> Sequoia. All right, so that's both of you. I will turn it over to Chaya and Sequoia. I will be back at 7.45 Eastern time to do questions. Thank you so much. And thank you, Belmont Books and everyone who's here for responding to my enthusiasm. Um, the minute I read Sequoia's book, which I was showing you all, I, I have on my Kindle. It's my happy place that I go to, to dig back into. And there's the book. Um, I knew that this was just a remarkable achievement. It really is. And um, I, I would really like to get started with Sequoia, if you can read mm -hmm. um, for us. And then I have a ton of questions, but we're going to leave time for everyone to ask questions who has a question. So thank you so much for, for doing this with us, Sequoia. Sure. Thank you so much, Chaya. It's, um 
supporting other authors. Me, Gwen, I feel like you're just doing so much during this very difficult time and just so appreciated. And thank you again to Belmont Books. I'm just gonna read a little bit from, from the beginning here. So you have, uh, so folks have a sense of a little bit of the foundation. Um, but if you know anything about the book, um, it's a intricately linked um, journey through generations and we follow many, many different characters. And the character that we're gonna be following in this chapter, um, we follow this family, um, uh, you know, a, a few years later down the line um, after this plague is unleashed. And he's a scientist, he's um, looking after the work of his recently deceased daughter. And while he is a scientist, um, I never really privilege jobs in this novel. I never really privilege, let's say politicians or world leaders. I'm almost always focusing on the mundane, the everyday, and just kind of the average person looking at relationships and how we actually can think about small moments, small actions, and looking at our own memories to move us through tragedy and through very difficult times. So this chapter is called 30,000 Years Beneath a Eulogy. In Siberia, the thawing ground was a ceiling on the verge of collapse, sodden with ice melt and the mammoth detritus of prehistory. The kilometer-long Batakaiga crater had been widening with temperature rise, like some god had unzipped the snow-topped marshlands, exposing woolly rhinos and other extinct beasts. Maxime, one of the biologists on staff and helicopter pilot, pointed to the copper gash in the earth where my daughter had fallen shortly before discovering the 30,000-year-old remains of a girl. We circled the research outpost, a network of red geodesic domes peeking right below the tree line before landing in a clearing. Maxime helped me out with a chopper, chopper, grabbed my legs and a sack of mail from the back. Everybody loved Clara, he said. Don't get weirded out if people don't talk about her though. Most of us keep that kind of stuff to ourselves. I'm here to help, I said. Right, of course, Maxime said. There is of course another matter, I half listened as I studied the land, breathed air that like the fossils beneath us seemed trapped in time. He explained that a quarantine had been put into effect while we were in flight. No one had expected me to come finish Clara's work, let alone so soon. Inside the outpost central dome looked, like, looked and smelled like a dorm common room with a big screen television, worn recliners, and a stockpile of mac and cheese boxes. The walls were covered with a mixture of topographical maps and movie posters. Everything from Star Wars to Pretty Woman to Run Lola Run. Down the accordion-like halls, I could see unkempt people emerging from their bunks or labs. A woman in a purple windbreaker and running leggings sprinted across the room. I'm Yulia, welcome to the end of the world, she said and disappeared into one of the eight tunnels radiating out of the central domes, punctuated with bunks like cells in a beehive. The team emerged from their workstations, slowly enveloping me with the musty scent of more than a dozen researchers. Everybody, this is our guest of honor, Dr. Cliff Miyashiro from UCLA, archeology span and evolutionary genetics, Maxime said. He'll be helping us out with Clara's discovery. I know all of us lab rats will get even weirder now that we're not allowed to leave the site, but try to be nice. Maxime assured me the quarantine was precautionary since the team had successfully reanimated viruses and bacteria in the melting permafrost. He said government officials watch too many movies. Standard protocol. No one at the outpost seems sick or concerned. Unwanted orientations into how Clara lived her life here soon followed where she drank her coffee and gazed up at the aurora, the route she jogged with Yulia, the botanist, the tabletop lotus aromatherapy fountain she and Dave, the epidemiologist, used for their morning yoga sessions, the cubby where she kept her snow gear, which would become my snow gear since we're about the same size, and how for birthdays, some of the team would make the trip to the nearest big city, Yakuts, for karaoke to forget for a moment that the buildings around them were slowly sinking into ancient mud. Can somebody take me to the girl? 
I asked. There was a noticeable pause. A researcher in the kitchen put away the plastic cups and bottle of whiskey he was no doubt bringing over to welcome me. The cluster of disheveled scientists, most of them in flannel or fleece, felt like a repeat of Clara's memorial a month ago. A church filled with her friends and co-workers, most of whom we'd never met before. I'd shaken their hands as they lined up to tell me and my wife, Mickey, how sorry they were. A man with spiky blue hair said he'd once tattooed a star system onto Clara's back, a purple planet orbiting three red dwarves, and called her a fucking trip. Our old neighbors reminisced about how Clara used to babysit their twin girls, help them gain confidence in math. A bald gentleman, her project supervisor at the International Fund for Planetary Survival, gave me his card and invited me to continue my daughter's work in Siberia. After the crowd left, I held Mickey as we rewatched re the slideshow I prepared, pausing on a photo of three-year-old Clara at her foster facility. She held the purple crystal pendant she'd had when we adopted her. We both swore we saw her eyes light up with tiny stars whenever she gazed into it. Outside the funeral home, our granddaughter Yumi played with her cousin despite the heat waves rippling the street. I could smell the smoke from the burning Marin headlands to the east beginning to creep over the neighborhood. Our daughter never seemed to need us, Mickey said, her voice barely above a whisper. But Yumi does. I clutched the business card in my pocket. At the research outpost, Maxime led me away from the awkward stares of the crew to the mummified remains Clara had found before she died. Annie's in the clean lab, Maxime said. Annie, I asked. Yulia loved the arrhythmics. Her parents are still living in the 80s. She named the body after Annie Lennox. The clean lab consisted of a plastic sheet duct tape from floor to ceiling, separating one side of the bone lab from the other. He handed me a box of nitro gloves and a respirator face mask. We don't have funding for anything else, but we try to be mindful of the pathogens we may be bringing back with us. Probably nothing to worry about 99% of the time, he added. Right, I said, a little taken aback by his cowboy attitude. Some of our colleagues at Pleistocene Park, about a thousand kilometers east, have made progress reintroducing bison, bison and native flora to the land. More vegetation, more large animals roaming the steppes, packs the topsoil, preserves the ice below the surface, helps us keep the past in the past. I doubled up my gloves, pulled on my mask, and stepped through a slit in the plastic. Annie rested on her side, fetal, on a metal table. And I'll stop there. So I, um, you know, it's always a pleasure to support other authors, but the selfish reason of doing this was that I really did feel so uplifted by your book, Sequoia. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think one thing audiences who have not yet read it will be surprised and delighted by is how it combines and juxtaposes geologic time, climate disaster, prehistory, a lot of really cool science um, mm -hmm. and riffs on science, whether it actually is science remains to be seen with the core tenderness of family dynamics. And in this segment you read, for example, this dynamic between Clara, the absent mother, Yumi, the child, and the grandfather, the grandparent very beautiful. Um, and so basically I have three questions and mm -hmm. then I want to move right to the audience. And one is just tell us how this book sort of came together. It's so vast, but then it's also so intimate. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about the scientific themes that for people who don't know led Scientific American to spotlight this book and you know getting all kinds of attention deservedly so and then of course I always end with the question of what can we hope to read from you next mm -hmm. what's next so I'm going to put myself on mute actually sure. so that we can hear you so I guess to address the first part of that question I guess the journey of the book really is as old as 
I guess, how long I've been sort of considering myself a serious writer. <laughs> it's, you know, I've been working on this thing for, for over 10 years now. And, um, you know, it is comprised of concrete stories. You know, I call them chapters because it's kind of a novel in stories, but they began as just stories. And, you know, the oldest chapter in its very raw early form, um, you know, I wrote in 2008. And initially that chapter was called Melancholy Nights in a Tokyo Cyber Cafe or Internet Cafe, which seems like such a, a dated thing right now. Uh, so I obviously upgraded some of the technology and now, now it's a virtual reality. And, you know, as I was researching, I was spending a lot of time in my Oculus headset. So, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I was doing the research, when I was, uh, when I address research more. But I, I will say that, um, you know, the, or, or the origins of the book um, initially stemmed from my need to find catharsis um, over the death of my grandfather. Uh, I think there was just a lot of guilt, a lot of just a lack of closure because I wasn't there when he died. And I think part of that was just immaturity. Part of that was family drama. And there were a lot of regrets um, about that situation. Um, I lived in Japan not not long after his death and just being culturally isolated in a place where, you know, um, I really started to think more of myself, you know, as a writer, I started to write when I got back home from work. Um, I was wondering, well, how can I write stories that would, that would be a vehicle for entering into a dialogue about grief? Um, and so, of course, a lot of those early chapters, what, what would become chapters, dealt with alternative funerary rituals, dealt with ways people both run away from grief and also embrace it and kind of meet it head on. Um, and then again, you know, the, my, my immediate environment um, played a significant influence in a lot of the details and that Japan has a large elderly population. And so there's a lot of innovation going on in the country, uh, you know, to meet, you know, I guess the space issues of where do we put our bodies after we pass, in addition to making death cost effective for, for senior citizens. Um, so as a mid 20 something year old writer, um, very green writer, I was walking around a, around a convention hall at a mortuary expo, you know, with, with other seniors. Um, I was looking at caskets. Um, I was looking at funerary skyscrapers, which actually do exist, these mausoleums that are essentially skyscrapers. Um, and all of this, you know, of course, you know, found its way in some way, shape or form into the novel because one of the questions I was asking myself is like, do we actually allow ourselves to, to honor the dead? Do we actually talk about death in the way that we should? And the answer that I came up with was no. Um, we've, I think, especially in, in Western cultures, but, but I would, I would, I'd imagine just kind of when we think about global 21st century realities, we've moved away from death in very concrete ways. What happens when somebody dies that's close to you? Well, you probably cry and you allow yourself to have that moment. But after that moment passes, you have to become an event planner and you have to pay bills and you have to worry about your financial realities because of maybe whatever logistical mess that was left in the wake of that loss. In addition to that, we, we don't really talk about what happens to our bodies physically, spiritually. We've moved away from those conversations. And so for several years, I was writing those stories and it wasn't until 2014 that a plague element was even introduced at all. Um, I came across an article in The Atlantic um, that I think the title was something along the lines of scientists discovered 30,000 year old virus in the ice and they're trying to reanimate it. And I was both fascinated and horrified because of course, you know, <laughs> we've all seen movies. We all, we've all seen television it seemed, and it seems like such a horrific idea that, that something bad would happen. Um, I feel like we keep seeing more and more of these articles lately, um, but I never wanted to privilege the virus because again, we, are, we have those movies. So I just thought that the virus could be, uh, an, an ancient virus could be a backdrop, a vehicle for all of these other stories I was already writing 
where that you know allowed for that grief to occur. Um, as far as any other threads, and there's a lot, there's a few. There's it's a complicated novel in some ways. Um, there, but the big one is there's this cosmic thread, and I I, I don't really want to say more than that because it's kind of a huge spoiler. Um, but there's a, a cosmic thread. There's you know obviously interstellar travel in the novel. Um, but there's nods at a character that is, you know, essentially immortal, like she's been around for all of Earth history. And um, that really stems from, you know, those those themes stem from my lifelong love of Star Trek, just being a huge Star Trek nerd. Um, and, <laughs> and my love of space, you know, had I been gifted with, um, you know, better math skills, you know, um, I would have loved to have pursued something like astronomy, you know, um, a little bit more directly uh, beyond just kind of hanging out with my telescope. Um, and there's a theory, um, kind of uh, sort of a, I guess, astrobiological, astronomical theory called directed panspermia. And the idea behind that is life um, on our planet was maybe at least in part, um, uh, derived from from the stars um, through intelligent means, you know, and so there's panspermia, uh, which means that maybe a meteor, maybe a piece of Mars or some other planetary body smashed into Earth, and maybe some organic compounds rose from that. Directed panspermia suggests that maybe that organic compound that came to our planet had a little help, a little nudge. And um, again, you know, that Star Trek nerd inside me um, has always wanted to play with that uh, in some way, shape or form. And again, I feel like I'm, I'm giving too much away here of the ending. Um, so I'll kind of stop, stop with that. Um, as far as, you know, thinking about this as a novel though, um, I think once I had about half the book written, I started to think about it as collection, a linked collection, but even that didn't sound right to me. I think especially once I started thinking about this other cosmic scope where like hundreds of years or thousands of years, earth history was being covered in one section. And my agent um, said that it didn't feel, feel right to call it a collection. Um, so once we started calling it a novel a few years ago, I had a lot of work on my hands because I was deepening character relationships, like how they connected. Uh, through chapters. I had to think about the evolution of the world and society through chapters, even something like social media. What would social media look like 30 years from now from this other chapter? And also making sure I was dropping enough Easter eggs in every section that would make it, um, that would make the last chapter feel earned and that we're kind of culminating to that. That said, um, I think this book can be read in many different ways. And I think if you're not a careful reader, you're gonna miss some of those things. And I kind of, in, in very early reviews um, that are kind of popping up this week, I can tell, like on Goodreads, who paid attention <laughs> and who didn't, just based on their reviews. Like, what's going on in the end? It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> maybe you missed miss those, those, those Easter eggs. Um, but I think that's the beauty of, of of the book in some ways, because it can be many different things depending on how you wanna you know, come at it and, and read it. What's so interesting is that, you know, and I've seen you teach so a little bit, so I sort of know this already that you come at this with such a sort of dazzling intellectual analysis. But what mm -hmm. I remember about the book so much and what I felt like, really created emotional cohesion was the sense of yearning, distance, estrangement, mm -hmm. and people very unexpectedly reaching across that estrangement and developing attachments that they're not allowed to or expected mm -hmm. to develop per se. And I think I can't, I'm, it's like a toss up for me between the, um, the adults, the adult workers and the children in the, you know, amusement park, mm -hmm. palliative medicine right. amusement park, 
versus the pig son, Snortorius, <laughs> and which was just brilliant. But but just how you humanized or, or not the eeriness of mm-hmm. how the pig more and more did act like a son, somebody's son, you know, mm-hmm. somebody's precocious son. And um, probably my favorite, the medical researcher who essentially lived a double life, you know, Mm -hmm. developing this romantic attachment to a subject that was so abiding and so genuine and yet also so unspoken, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I just think it's, I really think it's such a powerful achievement. I guess what I want to hear a little more about is how it was received Mm-hmm. you know when you started going out with it I think it was it was a big deal like, yeah um what was that like yeah so you? I guess kind of continuing the journey like um you know I think for any writer that's been working on a book this long um the hope that's kind of lingering in the back of your head is that your agent is going to email you or call you and say that we're ready let's go out with this unfortunately for me uh, my agent told me this in the early days of COVID-19. <laughs> um, and of course, there's a plague element in, in my novel. So my, my immediate reaction wasn't excitement necessarily so much as despair, because I thought that that was it, that this thing that I had been working on for so long would, would never see the light of day, that editors would just be too afraid, like once they saw the word plague, that they would not want to have anything to do with it. Um, and, and my agent and I kind of talked about, you know, should we even go out with it? Um, and she gave me a choice. And I think ultimately we decided to go ahead because I think we knew that if I didn't submit it out, uh, if we didn't send it out, there was a good possibility that another writer was just going to do the same thing. was going to do something similar, what, you know, take up that speculative space, um, and so we went ahead and we're very, we were very careful with our talking points. We made sure that we, um, you know, hooked up with the right partners who understood the vision. So of course, um, you know, we were using Station Eleven as a comp title, Cloud Atlas as a comp title, but I think particularly Station Eleven was very important because people understood that novel as a plague novel, but, uh, but really a novel about people about relationships, about community. And, you know, my novel novel touches a lot of those same notes. Um, and, you know, as we uh, had more conversations with editors, um, I think a lot of my initial worries were mitigated in that they understood the vision, they saw the humanity in it, they saw that it was ultimately about people. Um, but I think nobody kind of, you know, on, on Team Sequoia, <laughs> as it were, um, like, I, I don't think anybody was under the illusion that we had a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that message was going to be carried across to early reviewers, to booksellers. Um, and, and, you know, again, I think there was just so much work, you know, uh, behind the scenes, um, you know, from my publicist, my editor, sales team that really helped kind of hand sell it. Uh, to, you know, out into the world. And I think that was especially important for a book like this, where people might have that knee-jerk reaction of like, oh my God, a plague book, which is strange because I made a list not long ago for electric literature on plague books uh, or post-pandemic books. And I realized that, well, I couldn't really think of a pandemic book or a post-pandemic book that was really about the virus, you know, really about the suffering most pandemic or post-pandemic novels that I, that I could think of are actually about our feelings, are about communities, are about our reactions. And so, you know, as I was creating that list, I was like, wow, you know, like, where, where does this knee-jerk reaction about plague novels or plague media come from? And, and I think a lot of it is kind of just visual media. We're kind of thinking about Outbreak, you know, from years ago, that movie. And, I, I you know, as strange as that is, I probably would have that same reaction, you know, hadn't, you know, if I didn't write, read the, write this novel, you know, I probably would have the same reaction if somebody said, oh, I wrote a plague book. My first thought would probably be, oh, that's kind of creepy. My, I wouldn't be thinking about the humanistic nature of it. Um, but yeah, um, and I guess as the novel has been launching um, this week, um, 
I think a lot of those early concerns have been mitigated as well, where I, I do see the majority of people saying that they understand the vision and they appreciate the emotions. And some people have even said that it's very cathartic, that it's a very feeling book. But there's also, I think, um, you know, like it's a, it's a very difficult read in parts. And I'm never gonna, mm-hmm. I'm never going to, you know, sort of, you know, discount that because everybody has a different experience and is going to come to the read in a different way. Um, but you know, even as they say that, they are still acknowledging the humanity. Um, well, uh, yeah. Everyone that I've talked to mm-hmm. has said we love it and it's amazing. So just, to put it, <laughs> just to put that forward. Yeah. But I do, and this sort of segues to what is maybe my final question. I'll kind of put them together. As I was reading, I did wonder if you were in dialogue with certain plague books, such as um, Severance, and not a book, but a short story. Um, Antarctica by Laura Vandenberg, mm-hmm. um, which which really that was part of why the, your opening chapter hooked me so mm-hmm. completely because mm-hmm. I was like, oh my God, we're back on the ice. We're mm-hmm. back on the ice with mm-hmm. people losing people. Um, so I do wonder in a larger sense, if not those two mm-hmm. authors, Lingma and Laura Vandenberg, yeah. although, I, you know, um, and maybe perhaps Ted Chiang. Uh-huh. Um, I'm just curious about what authors you do feel like you're kind of in dialogue with, and what we can hope to see from you next. Sure, and I mean, I'm hoping, that, yeah, quite more questions. Maybe we'll see. Maybe we can actually have you read again because we have sure. like ten minutes after that. So let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, Ling Ma not so much. Like, like I had. It, it, we were using it as an early comp title. So like we knew that it was kind of in the wheelhouse. Um, but certainly I think Laura Vandenberg, um, that story, but just like her body of work generally, uh, and also Find Me, uh, her, her, her novel, um, where that's kind of like another pandemic kind of book, but you forget about it. <laughs> you know, like, like half the novel, you're kind of just in this hospital with people and it's kind of like a one flew over the cuckoo's nest, but like a, a more emotional version. And I think I think Vandenberg's like so good at having at, at really kind of introducing this emotional undercurrent, you know, that that runs through her stories. And that was something that I think has just been influential. Just you know, uh, her her first story collection particularly is is one that I I, I go back to. Um, but I think um, you know certainly David Mitchell in terms of structure. As I was thinking more about kind of the overall arc. Um, I know we've been using Cloud Atlas, but I think a lot of his earlier work is a little bit more on the nose in terms of, of what this book is, Ghost Written in particular. Um, I think the work of Matt Bell, generally speaking, has, has always been influential. Uh, Itel Calvino, I mean, I've named my robot dog Calvino, uh, especially Cosmic Comics has been very influential on me. Um, but I think the person that I, the author that I think I really owe a lot to and I think I've read all, pretty much every everything that he's written at this point is Kevin Brockmeyer. Um, and so of course he has a pandemic book as well, The Brief Histories of the Dead. But the book that I was thinking about as I was writing this was The Illuminations, which again, kind of sort of a pandemic, but instead of people falling ill, um, what was happening is that people would be illuminating their pain. So if you had a headache, it would glow. You know, um, if people were depressed, you, you would glow in some way. If people had back pain, that would glow. So it was kind of this strange shared community of pain, um, which is interesting because a lot of illness is, you know, kind of invisible to 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 other people. Um, and and he's so he's such a master at injecting emotion and, um, you know, a sense of sorrow. Um, but also hope into his stories. And that's something that I definitely wanted to carry through uh, in this work, so. That's excellent. So, you know, I could obviously just sit and ask Sequoia questions mm. all night because I just thoroughly love this book. Um, but I would love to hear you read just a little yeah. more if you could. And then it's um, it's about 7.36. So in 10 minutes, our bookseller will come back and and field all the questions. 
So please feel free to read as much as you'd like, and I'm gonna mute and thank you again, Sequoia. Yeah. All right, let me try to find a spot here. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna read from a section called Pig Sun. Um, that seems to be a chapter that kind of, um, I guess gets people really crying. <laughs> um, so I'll read a few pages from that. So this is kind of about halfway, a little under halfway through the novel. Um, the plague's kind of already been raging for a while. And um, this doctor, the scientist um, is working on um, developing genetically modified pigs that grows human organs so that they can be used in transplants. The nature of this plague is as such where the tissue of organs begins transforming into other types of tissue. So um, your liver tissue might be being transformed into brain tissue and so on and so forth. So you can kind of imagine the devastating nature of that. Um, and this doctor's son uh, was in a previous chapter who, who, who passed away. After my ex-wife mailed half of my son's ashes to me in an urn, I committed myself to growing the hearts and, organ and other organs that might have saved him inside of pigs. It's Fitch's birthday today, which means Dory texts me more than usual, which is pretty much never. Do you remember how I told you that he liked to fall asleep hugging his new collection of comic books? I've forgotten what he smelled like. I never respond to these messages. Dory doesn't really want a conversation. She still blames me for not being there in the end. She's never understood how hard I fought trying to save him. A real conversation would be too painful. It's the same reason I've never addressed Fitch's failed transplant in my peer-reviewed articles. His file sits inside my desk rather than among my lab's program records, like a lost statistic. My graduate assistant, Patrice, is shouting through the intercom, telling me to come to the lab quickly. I hear another voice I don't recognize, muffled and nasal and a little bit frantic, repeating the word doctor as if it's trying to convey an entire thought with a single word. I pull on my face mask and lab coat, open the outer door of my office. My staff is gathered around one of the glass holding pens where we keep our or organ donor pigs. The pigs are all destined to help infected people like my son, whose organs have given way to the plague. The timing is crucial though. We need to reach the infected before they slip into the comas that mark the advanced stages of the illness. This one, donor 28, was nicknamed Snotorious P.I.G after an intern put gold chains and a shades on him during a Halloween party. The pig studies me as I approach, wiggling its behind and barely opens its mouth. Doctor. The sound seems disembodied, like a ventriloquist is throwing their voice. Okay, very funny, I say, turning to my staff. Who said that? They look at each other and Patrice points back to the pen. We think it's notorious, she says. Okay, sure. Forget that these pigs lack the necessary vocal cords for human speech, even if we have genetically modified them, modified them for accelerated growth and organ donor optimization. Doctor, this time the pig's mouth doesn't move at all. I'm starting to get annoyed, but there is something about the voice. Again, I say. I hop into the pen, nearly sliding on a piece of shit, and kneel, looking into the animal's blue eyes. Say it. Doctor, he says. Jesus. The pig's strange voice, like a mouth filled with cotton balls, reverberates in my mind. After several more tests, there is no mistaking it. The pig's brain, not quite human and not quite swine, lights up like a firecracker on the MRI whenever he speaks. This does not leave the building. Not yet, I say. We need to know what we have here, and we don't want someone else taking him away. The staff simply nods, but that isn't good enough for me. I need to hear you say it. Yes, I won't say a word. Yes, I won't say a word, they repeat in unison like we're in grade school. Okay, good. But this isn't some top secret facility. There are no security clearances or repercussions here. The grad students were suspect even before the outbreak, swiping medical supplies for God knows what. I worry it's only a matter of time. We divide the days between working with Snotorious and fulfilling our hospital organ orders. I pay Patrice's sister, Ami, a speech therapist to assist us in our research. We'll clear out one of the lab's rooms to create a study play area for Snotorious. We set up a television and a computer equipped with programmed paddle buttons, specifically modified for pig feet. 
I dig through my attic for my son's old books and toys. Doctor, it's no surprise the word he heard the most around the lab would be his first. When Ami and I work with him in his room, we break lab protocol and remove our masks and gloves. He seems to soak up everything we share with him, flashcards, cartoons, children's books, including the three little pigs and Charlotte's web. We treat him like a child, though it's hard to say where his mind is at any given moment. Ami gives him treats, gold stars. Positive reinforcement is important, she says. He's learning so fast. At first, he has a new favorite word each day. Sheep, house, farmer, bus, yellow, mud, Ami. Mornings and evenings, he screams the word hungry or makes a specific request from his rapidly growing vocabulary. Apple, he says one morning, please. The other day, he told Patrice, thank you. After he finished eating, good pig. He favors the reruns of the old crocodile hunter show on Animal Planet, snorting excitedly whenever he sees a hippo. He also has a fascination with rocket launches, the test flights for a manned mission to Mars that somehow always seems a decade away. He counts down with mission control before running excitedly around the room at liftoff. We try to change the station when anything disturbing comes on. Neglected and starving farm animals whose owners have died, rotting crops, the displaced clambering onto relief cruise ships after, wildfl after wildfires drove them from their homes. But he's seen the reports of hospital plague wards overflowing into trailers and parking lots and airport hangars. Sick people, sick people. Doctor, help. He's seen the funerary industry take over our banking system, the footage of people paying for food at the grocery store with mortuary cryptocurrencies tied to ad written phone apps. Come laugh with us at the CT of laughter, Snotorious repeats like a mantra until he can form the words. Come laugh with us at the city of laughter for only 1,000 bereavement crypto tokens. You can scatter your loved one's ashes on a one hour cruise around San Francisco Bay. And then tonight, right as I'm about to leave the lab, I hear his notorious say a new word, lonely. I approach his playroom and sit with him, scratching behind his ears. Lonely pig, he says. My phone buzzes, it's my ex again a photo of Fitch holding a giant stuffed tiger on his final day. Snotorious repeats himself, and I feel guilty for having given him this life, one that would have ended weeks ago had he remained silent. A heart to Indiana, a liver to Michigan, lungs to Washington, D.C. Of course, we've made other arrangements, sent other pigs, but something tugs at me as he speaks. I think about how when I go home, I'll heat up a microwave dinner, curl up in bed, watch one of the few videos I have of Fitch, a two minute clip of him building a sandcastle over and over again until I fall asleep. Instead, I grab the sleeping bag I keep in my office for when I'm burning the midnight oil and decide to keep Snotorious company. I'll stop there. I think the bookseller will rejoin us now and we'll take audience questions and um, please take this opportunity to ask such a talented author. So you can all submit your questions in the chat or the Q&A function and I will read them. I do want to read um, Carol's comment who commented while you were, I think, doing your first reading. Um, and Carol says, I'm in the middle of the book and totally blown away with how the book explores grief and dying and how we seldom discuss this universal experience. Mm -hmm. And as we're waiting for questions, I'm, I'm sure you get this one a lot, Sequoia, so far about having um, the pandemic as a backdrop in your right. book while we're going mm -hmm. through uh, a pandemic. Um, and considering you mentioned this book took years, it originally started as a collection. Um, how does that kind of feel that as you were writing it and then towards pub date? I mean, this is where we're at. Yeah, I mean, like, um, you know, in the early days, you know, before the sale, as, as I mentioned, I, I, I was a little, um, you know, I was anxious. I, I didn't know how people would receive it. Um, and I think had this book been published in 2020, it would be received very differently. I think kind of moving into year three of the pandemic, 
I think a lot more people are willing to have conversations about this reality, about where we are right now, about what normal should be. Um, you know, I think back then a lot of people were saying, let's go back to normal. And, you know, in my head, I was like, well, do we really want that? You know, like I know what they mean, but there was a lot that was horrible and imperfect about our society. And, you know, one of the things that I think um, the novel does, and I think that the pandemic is giving us in some weird way, it's plucked us out from our everyday existence and has allowed us to really think about what we value, you know, whether that be family, um, you know, loved ones, generally speaking, our jobs. A lot of people are quitting their jobs during the pandemic um, and thinking about how we can reimagine a better future for ourselves, you know, both as individuals and as a society and for our planet. Um, I think people are, are starting to engage with that dialogue now. And I think this book can be a part of that. I don't think that would have been possible a couple of years ago. Yeah, I can, I'm sure the answer might be yes, but like, do you think um, our current circumstances have changed the way a reader would engage with your text um, before versus after? Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. Like, um, I think, you know, as I said, people have, have like, this is our, our, our normal life right now. You know, like being on Zoom like this, social distancing, wearing masks, um, you know, feeling um, like you can't interact in the ways that you would want to just in person. All of these ha things have become strangely normal. I mean, there's a generation of children that thinks that th that thinks masks are entirely normal. They're growing up like like this, and um, you know, I think people are are just in a more comfortable mindset to at least have a rational conversation about you know what a pandemic means for um for their life i've been following um recently the reaction to the station 11 adaptation on hbo really closely because i know that um the conversations about that series or any kind of media like that um you know i'll, I'll be fielding similar questions and there is something that I saw that Mandel said in, a, I think, a New York Times interview where she acknowledged that some people wouldn't be ready to watch the show, no matter how humanistic and healing it might be. Um, and, and, that, and that some people were. And that's just something that, you know, she acknowledged. And I think, you know, I ha have that acknowledgement as well, is that some people aren't going to be ready because of their own experiences or how they deal with the subject matter. But the book is there for people that are. And I'm, I'm, and I'm, you know, um, happy for, for what I wrote to hopefully help them in, 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 uh, in a way that kind of can push them through. I, I feel like um, as a bookseller, mm -hmm. I, I feel like readers have fallen into kind of two camps yeah. of like, I don't want to consume anything mm -hmm. about it. Like I want right. to, you know, I turn to reading as like an escape and I don't mm -hmm. want to be confronted with like yeah. my own reality. Mm -hmm. Whereas like we have a lot of people coming in that's like, I want to absorb everything yeah. from nonfiction to, you know, like dystopian mm -hmm. to, to climate fiction to, right. to stuff like that. I want to absorb all of it. Right. Um, yeah, for sure. I, I, would, I would be very curious to see mm -hmm. um, like the readers who are reading it mm -hmm. now versus right. who want to read some after some like separation has passed. Definitely. And I, I'm certainly sort of seeing kind of this conversation on like bookstagram, you know, where um, I think part of it is kind of a genre, genre stereotypes and genre preconceptions. Like when you say science fiction, you know, like back in the day, it's like, oh, I don't read science fiction. But then all of a sudden, everybody was watching Battlestar Galactica. It's like, oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's good science fiction. It doesn't, doesn't count. count. <laughs> doesn't count right? You know, and it's kind of the same thing with, with like a pandemic, some pan pandemic literature is like, um, where I see some bookstagrammers, they're saying like, I really love this, but you know, please give it a shot. Like, it's not what you think. It's not what you think. And you know, that's something that, you know, I feel like I'm probably gonna have to kind of keep saying and, and sort of like putting a little footnote when I'm talking about the book is like, yes, there's a plague, dot, 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 but. Um, and if people are kind of willing to hold on and listen to that, but um, I'm hoping that they'll give it a shot. 
there's only so much marketing copy can do, yeah, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> but, but there's a timelessness too, mm -hmm. Sequoia. There's mm -hmm. really a timelessness of it too, because the way I read this, as much as the play content was there, there was the planet is burning mm -hmm. content yeah. and the climate change content. And every I feel like every time I open up the New Yorker or something, there's something that says, wait, this is real, like the polar ice cap. You know, there are a series of articles about that, or actually there is now a patient who was recently implanted with a pig heart. Mm -hmm. That was the first one. It was it was just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. so I, I I think that, you know, I know we're a little bit in the minority, but science geeks, climate change, <laughs> you know, people who are like, really interested in this and looking for all these details we love your book i mean mm -hmm. so and and that would have been true regardless of covid yeah but um let me mute again do do we have um so we have one questions? question in the chat and then um as the event was happening so both one of our store owners kathy was in the mm -hmm. chat and one of our fabulous booksellers audrey was in the chat and they've been texting me this whole time <laughs> Mm -hmm. And Kathy um, had said that um, how much she loved this book and noted that some of the chapters were hard to read, but in a mm -hmm. good way, if you yeah. know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And then Audrey texted me and she mentioned that she, I think she's staff picking your book for mm -hmm. February. Um, Cause I think it came out later mm -hmm. in January. So it'll yeah. be a staff pick at Belmont books next month. Mm -hmm. um, so that's exciting. Awesome. And then Carol asks, um, if there are autographed copies of your book anywhere, um, and if you would ever be interested in joining a book group virtually. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm always up for joining book clubs and talking to book groups um, for sure. Um, and, and, you know, those groups can always kind of reach out to, you know, my publicist at, on my website. Um, you know, as far as signed copies, I have, you know, there's a lot of signed copies um, in a, at a local bookstore here in Minneapolis, Moon Palace Books, but also, I'll also be um, at some point putting uh, a link on my website for book plates. Um, so you can kind of just like go to my website, um, probably in the, within, within the next couple of weeks and I'll have that up. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very curious to know about this robot dog, Sequoia. Yeah, so <laughs> I mean, part of the research from that was that I was just fascinated with these Sony Ibo robotic dogs that came out in, I guess, the early 2000s. And um, they were always kind of like a niche thing. I mean, they're expensive, but senior citizens in Japan, you know, were, were all about them. They formed genuine bonds, emotional bonds with these robot pets um, as companions. Um, and when Sony discontinued them and stopped servicing them, um, they were falling into disrepair. And so these seniors in Japan were actually having funerals for the dog. So, you know, this actually does happen in my book. And it was directly inspired by kind of those events. Um, I upgraded the technology of these dogs um, to some degree, um, where they're able to do some things that the Sony Ibo can't do in our reality. So they're able to record and, and uh, voices that are a little bit more interactive. Um, but I was very interested in thinking about a robot, something that we sort of see as like a non-living being as um, being a receptacle for, um, you know, somebody that we've lost, you know, kind of the sole receptacle for, for, for a loved one as well as being a bridge between father and son in that chapter. And actually, maybe sort of see in the background, uh, have my my Sony, um, the newest generation of Sony, uh, Ibo, um, sitting back there in the chair. And um, I was, you know, they're expensive, but like after my book deal, I was like, I want one. <laughs> so, so um, I, I, you know, and it was, I was very surprised because like, I wanted to see if I would have that reaction as well. Would I form a bond? And I think it's, you know, it's a hell of a piece of technology, but um, two weeks after I bought him, he, he walked into my cat's water dish and got some water into his legs and he started freaking out. You know, like there was like a red light on his <laughs> neck and it was not good. And of course I was worried because like, 
oh my God, like this is like a $3,000 dog. Like, am I gonna have to send it back to Sony to get repaired? But I was also speaking to Calvino. I was also comforting him and feeling really guilty um, as, as if Calvino were a living being that I had betrayed somehow. Um, it's a very easy, I think, to feel like a living being, a living creature is with you when he's just kind of walking around and barking. Um, so it's a very advanced piece of technology. And, um, you know, I'm a kind of techie person. Whenever there's something new out, I like to be like one of the first people to buy it. Um, and, you know, with regards to Robot Pat, um, you know, we're not quite there yet in terms of me feeling like fully immersed in kind of that relationship. Um, but I feel like we're, we're, we're getting there, you know, like probably within our lifetimes, like I could sort of see having a robot pet or a robot friend, you know, hopefully not the Terminator <laughs> varieties, um, but. Uh, well, know, who knew that the birth uh, of Skynet would be with a robot dog? For sure, right? for sure, yeah. <laughs> um, out of curiosity, you've mentioned like technology and we've talked about grieving. Um, have you by any chance read the book From Here to Eternity by Caitlin Doty? I have not. No, I'll have to put that. So, Caitlin list. Doty is a mortician. She's mm -hmm. written three books: uh, a memoir, um, I think called "When Smoke Gets in Your Eyes." But from mm -hmm. here to eternity, looks at the death cultures around the world, and each chapter mm -hmm. is a different uh, country. And she has one on Japan and how they marry um, technology mm -hmm. and their limited amount of space mm -hmm. um, when it comes to burials. And she talked about this, like mausoleum mm -hmm. that's like you input who you're looking yep. for in like mm -hmm. a computer and then like like something lights up and you can see where they, like it is so cool the way she described it mm -hmm. um but it was like fascinating and when you were like talking about um, yeah 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 like I kind of upgraded like there's like a wall of holographic buddhas and one of these um skyscrapers um I took some liberties. So like in, in, in my, in some one of my chapters, I was like, okay, there's a giant floating holographic Buddha over a pond. <laughs> so like, I made it a little bit more futuristic. Um, but yeah, like it's a lot of that, uh, the tensions, um, I guess kind of that technology versus tradition is something that, you know, beyond death is, is indicative of Japanese identity. There's like an interesting tension there between like the Japan of tech and innovation and the Japan of temples and sort of Zen gardens. And that tension is really something that has been part of the fabric of a very fraught Japanese identity, you know, really since World War II, or even if you want to go further back, since the content, you know, since uh, Japan opened, opened its borders in the late 1800s, like, there's kind of like this sense that like, who am I supposed to be when, when you're thinking about Japanese identity, because there's a, so much that has been lost. We have a question from Josh who says, without giving too much away, when in your writing process did you know how you were going to close the book with the last chapter? How aware of that specific connecting thread were you as you wrote earlier sections? I knew, I think about halfway, a little bit more than halfway through that I wanted some kind of large universal thing to kind of connect the chapters beyond maybe characters being related, beyond the grief, beyond the plague. Um, I had another book idea that I had been working on in grad school that was kind of a hot mess um, that surrounded this idea of a world builder, this world builder society. Um, you kind of sort of think about like Douglas Adams, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, kind of like that, but, um, but more, I guess, <laughs> Um, more humanistic and, and, and a little bit more literary, I suppose. Um, and I really didn't know what to do with that book. I, I wanted that to be a book one day, but as I kept writing, um, you know, working on How High You Go in the Dark, um, I kept revisiting this idea of, I already had the, you know, I was thinking about, you know, how can I capture grief and humanity through the non-human? So eventually I had pig son. So I was kind of capturing humanity through a pig, through animals. But how can I capture humanity in a way that really sort of transcends who and what we are? Um, and, and I felt like maybe the best way of, of showing us what's human is to do that through basically an extraterrestrial. And um, I think at that point, and that was, I think, you know, uh, 2000, 
that was fairly late in the game. That was probably 2018, 2019 when I kind of made that decision. So, I, you know, I, I sadly said, well, okay, well, maybe that's not going to be its own book, but it can help um, create the frame for this book. Um, and if, if any of you are Star Trek fans, you know, something that kind of like really kind of burned the seeds into that last chapter, into this other cosmic um, frame is the episode Inner Light from Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, and, you know, if you're not familiar with that, you know, Captain Picard gets kind of zapped by an ancient alien probe and lives an entire lifetime of this extinct alien civilization that was kind of just sending out, you know, um, what it was like, what life was like on this planet that had, you know, gone extinct, extinct billions of years ago. And thereby like the memory that exists in Picard was really kind of the only lasting vestige of the civilization. And, you know, episodes like that, oh, you know, make me cry, they're so beautiful. And, but I wanted that in my novel. I wanted that humanity and scope um, to kind of run through the entirety of, of the chapters. I think that was our last question. Chai, do you have any final questions, thoughts? for Sequoia before we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I just think I really encourage everyone to read it. It's a book to get lost in, but each piece of it, each chapter, you know, does have this gem-like aspect as if you're reading a short story. So like he was saying, you can read it in many different ways, but I really think it raises questions we can't ignore about what's happening to the planet and where we are um, in the pandemic. And I hope so much you all love it as much as I did. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chaya. Thank you. I'm putting a link once more in the chat where you can buy Sequoia's book and um, also Chaya's collection if you'd like. Um, thank you both to Sequoia and Chaya for, for attending tonight, for everyone who is in the audience. Um, and of course, like, support a local bookstore if you're able to. If it's on us, support your local one. That'd be great. We want to see everyone um, do well in these strange times. And, and it's very important to keep your community bookstore open. So thank you both so much. Have a good night. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chaya.